God is good all the time. That's some good business right there. Did y'all get any of that? The resurrected king is resurrecting me. I don't know about you, but I need some resurrection every once in a while. I need some resurrection today. I'd like to tell you that I've been gone and it's been vacation and I come back rested and ready to roll. But in all actuality, I'm worn out and I need some resurrection. That was some good, good thank you for that worship. That's probably the most thing I've missed besides you guys is, is the worship. Man, I haven't had worship, okay? And some people think, well, I don't really need it. But I'm telling you, I've been and spoke at a family reunion, which I love you. And it was good, but man, there's no worship, and it's just, here you go, good luck to you. And it, it, I was in Lexington, Kentucky last week, as many of you know, and, and it was a great opportunity, and, but at the same time, I mean, it's, uh, here they pull a little flatbed trailer in the arena, full, you know, in front of all these people and say, get after it, you know, bring them Jesus, and you're like, all right. <laughs> worship is good. It's a, it's a blessing to get to worship, and that's why we're resurrected, so that we can declare his word. And uh, so I'm glad to be here with you. I've missed you guys, but it's such a blessing to, to know that I don't have to be here and, and everything gets done and God's still glorified and it still moves on people's hearts because that's what, it's, that's what it's about. It's not about one person doing anything. It's about a family of God coming together and regardless of who's here saying, you know what, the resurrected king has resurrected me and I'm going to step up and I'm going to step in. I'm going to share the love of God and... And it's just going to be awesome. So anyway, Kirk mentioned that he didn't see her, but yeah, stand up, Karen. Stand up back there. Y'all, y'all know Karen Carbone, and she's just fresh in from the southern side, southern side of us from Panama. And I don't know exactly. I didn't think I didn't expect her to be in tonight. She she slipped in, and so man, what a blessing! Somebody that we've had a part in sending and. Man, to, to have, have her back, it just makes my heart, does my heart good. And, and I just pray that y'all love on her. And we just want you to be blessed while you're here. And we'll have an opportunity this month to hear her share what's going on. And, and I know she'll do that individually as well. But anyway, we'll get going tonight, the reading of the Word. We're going through Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 3 if you have your Bibles. If you don't, shame on you. Everybody doing all right tonight? You should see people when you go other places and you tell them, okay, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm glad you're here. It took me three minutes worth of horse training to get them in Kentucky to actually look at each other. But look, man, you can choose whether you come here today or not, but you can't choose your neighbor. And your neighbor's the one sitting next to you. So anyway, that's kind of funny. Romans chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 24, finish up this chapter. I know that Shane touched on this last week, and I was going to just go into chapter 4, but as praying this week, that's just kind of where the Lord led me. So that's what we're going to try to do in verse 24. It says this, it says, being justified as a gift by His grace through that redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the, the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, may we establish the law. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Just thank you for loving us, for the opportunity to just come and worship you, Father. We're all in a different place. 
We all have different things going on, but just less like the scripture said, you're the God of all of us. And so, Lord, I pray for a spirit of unity in this place. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to us exactly where we are, how about you love us and how you've redeemed our life. We thank you for being here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of wordage here like some of this is through Romans. And we're going to try to go through the scriptures but one, and, and kind of go down through it and see how it goes. But the one thing that kind of been sticking out to me the last two days, this one word that really uh, comes out to me is redemption. Redemption. And what that means for us as, as people of God, redemption, just uh, to get started, a little, a little definition is basically this. It's to rescue. It is to deliver one. It is to atone for guilt. It is to repurchase or to pay a price for. That's kind of what redemption is. Do you know this? We all need redemption. Every one of us needs redemption. You say, why do we, all, why do we need redemption? I'm a pretty good guy. We need redemption because what we just studied a couple weeks ago, Romans 3.23, for all. Somebody say all. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody can do it on their one. None. There's early in the chapter it says there's no one righteous. No, not even one as the Lord searches the earth. Yet verse 24 says, even though we have all fallen short, as children of God belonging to Christ, we are still justified by his grace. We're messed up, we're jacked up, we don't deserve anything, but yet we're justified by his grace. In other words, our redemption, as we get going tonight, is only found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus Christ. In verse 25, it tells us that God displayed his son publicly, publicly he displayed him for the world to see. It wasn't hidden, it wasn't done just in the temple of God at a little altar, but it was done in the display of the world for the world to see where it could not be denied the atonement which is by his blood. It's not just by being a good guy or telling us a good story or putting a belief system in place, but it's by his blood. It's only by his blood. And it goes on to say in forbearance, or in other words that means God is patient with us and he, he's abstaining from putting his wrath upon us and he has passed over us. As it says in that, in that verse, he has passed over us. And so all of you, this is simple stuff, but just as we go through it, we remember the Passover. Do you remember the Passover? I, I can remember the first time and to be honest with you, it was, it was like in about 2000. The Lord had come alive in me. I'd been saved. I'd been all this stuff. But I can remember when it clicked, this, the Passover, what it meant for me and how that related. Because you're always like, well, I don't need the Old Testament. I don't need that old stuff. But then you see it illuminated by the Spirit of God, the Passover. In, in Exodus 12, where it, where it originates, when, when God's people or Pharaoh's keeping them hostage in Egypt, you know, and God sends Moses and he tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he sends all these plagues and, 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 and Pharaoh would be like, man, get out of here. We're sick of it. And then he'll change his mind and come back. And it's the last plague that he sends before he finally lets the people go for good. And it's when he tells them, he says, listen, every firstborn son in every family is going to die. Every firstborn son is going to die. But he tells Israel this. He tells his people this. But you, my people, you get a lamb at twilight when the day begins and you slaughter the lamb outside. And you take the meat and you cook it all evening. And that night you eat it for supper. But before you eat supper in that day and with the blood that came out of the lamb, you take the blood and you put it on each side of each doorpost and over the top of the frame on your door. And it says this in Exodus 12 verse 13 it says for the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are and this is so powerful but the Lord says this still to this day he says but when I see the blood when I see the blood that's over your house then I'm going to pass by and no destructive plague will strike you, Do you that, how cool is that I mean it, it's not cool it's kind of nasty really think about it it's bloody it's yucky but you have to trust the Lord because there is no atonement and there is no redemption without the shedding of blood and he said, it's this serious. You take the best lamb without blemish and you slaughter it and you take the blood and you put it over your doorpost, over the 
the, the coming in of your house. And it's the same way for you and I. Jesus shed his blood. He is the Passover lamb. It happened on the feast of Passover, the unleavened bread. All of that is referring to the great Passover. And Jesus' blood ran down. And check this out. You and me as children of God, when we accept his sacrifice, we believe in what he did. We ask him to come into our life. What we're saying is we're taking the blood and we're putting it over the door frame of our life as we are the temple of God and check this out we can be in a maybe even in a jacked up state in our life and we're going through hell on earth and it's not easy and I don't know how I'm going to make it and I'm unsure about tomorrow but the Lord comes passing by and he's dealing with some people and he sees you and then it says when he sees the blood when he sees the blood over our life, it's like he passes over and he abstains from giving us exactly what we deserve. That's pretty good news right there. By the grace of God, Jesus, the Son of God, was slaughtered like a lamb. He was led to slaughter. He allowed it to be so that we as a believer could have his blood covering over us. At some point when the death angel comes, the Lord sees the blood of the lamb over us. When things in our life and the enemy is trying to get us and attack us, we need to understand that the blood of the Lord, the blood of the lamb is over my life. And it doesn't matter if I go to Kentucky and I'm dealing with a bunch of drunks or I'm struggling at a family reunion or I'm down there in Panama trying to reach people that don't never even heard about Jesus. We need to have confidence that over our life is the blood of the lamb. Verse 26, it goes on, it says, God did this as a demonstration of his righteousness at the present time. He displayed his son for the world to see as a demonstration of God's righteousness. He wanted us to see, and it says, at the present time. And that just makes me think, you know what? Even though it was at that present time, they didn't understand this demonstration. They didn't understand it. Some of them were even, most of them were approving of it. A lot of them had doubt. A lot of them had fear. The believers, the followers of Jesus, they didn't know. They didn't get it. But it was a demonstration of his righteousness at, the, at that present time. And that makes me think about, you know what? When I first heard the story of Jesus, I didn't really understand it. I didn't really get it when I first heard it. It didn't, it didn't strike me. It didn't move me. It wasn't something that I yearned for. It was a good story. It was kind of interesting the first few times you hear it. But it, it wasn't something that, that just clicked. But at that present time, when I became to believe and I began to open my heart and God began to stir in me and life began to happen, and all of a sudden it began to come alive to me. And at that point, it changed everything. And it became a proof of his righteousness. When I saw him for myself, I don't know if my eyes were closed. I don't know where I was at. I don't remember the first time. But I can remember when I saw him hanging like I had seen him so many times on the crosses and everything else. But at that moment, it was like... It was a demonstration of God's love, a demonstration of his righteousness about how he calls for us and he yearns for us to come to him. Does that make sense at all to you? At the present time, though, sometimes we don't understand it. But because he displayed it, and it was displayed, his righteousness, that now we can look back even 2,000 and some odd years later and we can see that God demonstrated his love. That while we were still yet sinners and even while we were afar off, Christ died for us. And we begin to see it. It reminds me of our kids, you know. I mean, we, you try to raise your kids up just and right. And you put limitations and you put restrictions on them. And as children, we don't understand it. And the kids get mad at us like, well, I don't know why. All my other friends are getting to do that. And they're getting to go hang out. And they're getting to act like this. And they're getting to wear their shirts this short. And we're like, well, I'm sorry. Your shirt needs to come down here when you're wearing tights. If you even wear tights. You, anyway, that's a different message. But anyway. And the kid, we don't understand it. The kid's like, well, you're being mean to me, and it doesn't make sense, and I don't know why you're making me work sometimes. I don't know why you're restricting me from certain, these certain places. But as they grow up, and they look back, and then they say, now I see why. And when they begin to have their own children and fight their own battles, they're like, now I'm glad, and now I appreciate what mom and dad did for me. And that's kind of the way the Lord, he did it, and it didn't make a lot of sense. It didn't click. But ultimately, we see the demonstration in our life. It goes on in, in the end of that verse 26, and it says, We see that he is just, and he is also the justifier of those who believe. 
God is just. Somebody say, God is just. God is always just. He is right, and his decisions are true. Sometimes we don't like the situations that we go through. Sometimes we don't understand the battles that we're facing. But let me tell you something. God is always just in his judgment, and he is always true, and he is always right. It's not my job to figure out or get him to manipulate it, to make it like I want it. My job is to submit because his ways are higher than my ways. And I'm drawing close to him because he's my redeemer, and he's the one that covers me. And so I'm just going to stand in him and trust him. He is always just, but at the same time, he makes a way, and he justifies for us. You see, he's just, and in other words, you know this stuff, but he's holy and he's pure and he's perfect. And so he can't have anything to do with sin that you and I are so contaminated with in this world. And so he wants us to come to him, but there's this line and because it's filth that we can't get there. And so what he did was he sent his son, this, his own seed that would grow up in this world and be man just like us. But in the end, he was going to be the perfect lamb that was slain for you and I. The perfect sacrifice that would atone us because we are filthy. And so he sends this holy filter being his son to take our place so that we can then come back to him he is a justifier for us here's a we're going to do a little word study i've never really done something like this but the words that jumped out the first word is because we all need help we all need help and so the first word that stuck out to me is this it's justification justification it's like this because of what Jesus did, he justifies us and we can come into the presence of God. Or we can come into church. You know, there's a lot of people that feel filthy. But because God has justified us, he allows us to come in. He allows us to, to simply believe. To come into kind of like his courtroom. And you know what justification, you've heard this said, justifying grace is just as if I had never sinned. But it's not because I did anything. It's all because of what he did. Number The second word is this propitiation say that three times can you do that go ahead we'll give you a mic i'm not going to say it because i have trouble saying it one time be like three snakes hissing in a pit you ever heard that i'm not going to tell it tonight propitiation it's it's like this we've been given favor propitiation it's because God has passed over us he's given us mercy aren't you thankful for God's mercy we're always talking about God's grace but God's mercy his Passover doesn't mean this is the end of the story but his mercy and his Passover means now follow me to the new land follow me to the next assignment he's passing over us he's not he's granting us mercy and not striking us down every time we stump our toe boy my toe's sore that's another story but he doesn't strike us down. He grants mercy. He has propitiation for us. His judgment is withheld. The next one is this, reconciliation. Reconciliation is like this. God is now inviting us into his house. He's inviting us to come hang out with us. He's reconciling what was separated. He's bringing us back to one. This is where enemies become friends. It's hard stuff. But this is what reconciliation is. We experience forgiveness of God that Kirk talked to you about Sunday. And so in relationship, whether it be with God or with other people, we receive forgiveness and we also extend forgiveness. That's the only way this works. If not, there is no reconciliation. But because of the blood, we have opportunity to receive reconciliation where we're restored. It always makes me think about the Apostle Paul. He was Saul from Tarsus. What was he? He was an enemy of God. He was going against Jesus. Jesus. He was murdering the Christians. He's driving them out, but he encounters God. He receives justifying grace. He sees the propitiation that, 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 that God offered him and passed over him when he was acting a fool. And now he wants everything. He wants to be reconciled. No longer I live, but Christ lives in me. I'm a child of God belonging to him. Total reconciliation. When we receive forgiveness and we begin to re be reinstated as children of God, which we were really originally created for. And the last one is this, redemption. Somebody say redemption. Redemption is, gave you some earlier, but it's also where there has been a payment made. There has been a payment made for something. And then hopefully set free. 
In the Old Testament, it talks a lot about Redeemer. A Redeemer was when there was one man or one somebody who was willing to pay a ransom or pay a price for someone else's debt. And it happened a lot where somebody was a bad businessman or they had a tough year and they lost everything and they were struggling. And so in debt, they would lose their place. They would lose everything they had and they maybe would become a slave. But if there was one person who was able, they had to be able and they also had to be willing. And usually, it, legally, it was to be someone that was kin to you. And that's where we get the term a kinsman redeemer. So if, some, if I lost everything and somebody was kin to me, say Kirk was a cousin or a brother or whatever, and I lost everything, and he says, I value you. I think you can overcome and do better next time. I love you. I have the ability, and I'm going to pay for your debt and restore you. We all know the story about in Ruth, right? You know the story in Ruth when it was Naomi. Naomi lost her husband, and she lost two sons. And so she lost everything. She, I don't know if she couldn't manage the farm. She couldn't cut the hay. She couldn't make it work. And so she goes broke and she loses everything. The only thing that she has left is a daughter-in-law named Naomi. And so what they did was they came up with this plan. And Ruth says, look, we have someone that's kin to us. His name's Boaz. You need to go to Boaz and, and make your case. And you need to become a servant of Boaz. And somewhere in there after you serve, don't just do it right off the bat, but serve. And then ask him, would he be willing to redeem us for we've lost everything? And so that's what she does. Long story short, she goes and Boaz is able and he's willing to purchase back and redeem them. Now, some of us have family members that sometimes we're like, I ain't paying your debt, man. I'm sorry. But that's the cool thing about the Lord because he purchased us. He paid our debt. He ransomed us. We're all in debt. We can't get out of this. We can't figure it out. We don't have a, uh, 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 we can't win a lottery big enough that's going to pay the price, that's going to pay the ransom that you and I all owe for the sin that we have. She, he, he redeemed us. Christ purchased us, and then he set us free. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life that you inherited from your forefathers, but rather you were purchased with the precious blood as of the lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, much the same. In him we have redemption through his blood. He redeemed us with what he did on the cross. We redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. A few things about redemption. Number one is this. We have to understand. This is repeat, but we can never forget it. By nature, we are all slaves to sin. We're all slaves to habits. We're all slaves to lust. We're all slaves to the dollar. We're all slaves to doing what I want to do. We're all slaves to something in this life. Romans 3.23. We all know that scripture now. The second thing is this. Jesus paid the price with his own blood. So first off, we understand that we owe. We're in a bind. And then we can see that Jesus paid the price with his own blood. I already said this, but there is no redemption without the shedding of blood. So we have this debt that we cannot pay. And every time I think of debt, I think of money. So I ask you this, how much money would it take for you to pay for one of your sins? Are the sins of this day, $5, $10, $20, $1, 000, 000, $1,000,000? All the money Trump has, all the money uh, Hillary spent on, 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 or a, on campaign, how much money would it take? The reality is this, there is no amount of money. Because it's not about things of this world. None of it can buy us anything. None of us can set us free. None of us can make us right. None of the works that we do can make us okay. Money may buy things. And it may make us acceptable in this world. But in the kingdom of God, acceptance is only by the blood. 
We're all accepted, not because we're good, not because I'm better than somebody else, not even because I'm better than I used to be. I'm accepted because of the blood. I can come into the throne room because of the blood, not according to how I sing, not according to how many right answers or wrong answers, only by the blood. This is where equality comes in. There's not different levels, different things. We may have different blessings and more crowns one day, but it's all because of the blood that equality brings, and it gives us a way in because... That's all we have. The third thing is this. Not only does it pay for us, not only does it justify us, but this is what the church and this is what the world needs to get a hold of. It sets us free from sin. Not free to be an idiot, not free to do everything in the world like sometimes we begin to think, but it sets us free from sin. Sin is an issue in the church. Sin is an issue in believers of Jesus Christ, and we're too, we don't want to deal with it because we might offend somebody or make somebody feel uneasy. And so we're in bondage because we're not completely set free. We're saying, I'm saved, I'm justified, but we're not walking in the full anointing. We're not walking in the full authority because we still have areas of our life that have not yet been redeemed. John 8, 32, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, being Jesus He's the way, truth, and the life, and what he did, and the truth will set you free. And you won't be shackled again, because that's what it says in verse 36. It says, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. We have to understand that God wants us to be fully, fully redeemed. He wants us to have freedom. Somebody say freedom. Freedom. Freedom to live as a child of God. Freedom to proclaim that there's victory in Jesus. Freedom to proclaim that there's forgiveness of sins. No matter where you've been, no matter what your past, no matter how you've been labeled, God is able to forgive you. God came down from glory and ultimately died so that you could be free. That you don't have to walk around with that burden. That you don't have to keep acting like you've always acted. That he wants to set you free to live a new life. Freedom. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from the past, rid of shame, fear, and anger, debt of sin. It's gone. It's wiped away. You don't have to pay it anymore. The chains are broken. You're released from the dirty habits that you've been carrying around and that stuff in your mind that you keep going back to and you keep remembering. You need to remind yourself that you are set free, that you have been redeemed. And I, man, I hate to say this. No, I don't. But here it is. People all the time say stuff like this. You know what? I'm just the way I am. You ever said that? I'm just the way I am. This is the way I brought up. This is the way we live. This is just the way I was made. Can I tell you, in Christ Jesus, you are fully redeemed. You don't have to be labeled. You don't have to be any of that stuff. We are fully redeemed. It don't matter if we've been whoremongers. It don't matter if we're an alcoholic, we're an addict, we're a gossip, we're a prideful dude, we're a liar, we're we're messed up in our sexuality, we have immorality, we're we're somebody that's manipulative. None of that matters because we've been set free from it. We don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. We have been redeemed so that we can walk in a new life. Anything, somebody say anything, anything that's contrary to the will of God. Can I tell you right now that Jesus came to set you free from that junk. He came to set us free from it. We're redeemed by the blood of the lamb and the devil is a liar. When he starts telling you you can't overcome it and you can't make it out and there's never going to be a way and you're just going to have to deal like this and you're going to have to take this medication and you're just always going to be stuck in this place. I'm telling you, God came that you could be redeemed, that you could be forgiven, that you could have peace in your mind and not deal with anxiety and fear and worry and stress and all this kind of junk because he came that we would be fully redeemed. And here's the deal. You don't do it. I don't do it. Jesus did it. Jesus does it all. All to him I owe. He paid it all, man. He did it. We just have to accept it. We have to accept it. When we hear God's forgiven me, I have to walk like I'm forgiven. Don't leave questioning, am I forgiven really? I don't know. I really screwed it up. And we'll convince ourselves back that I'm not forgiven. No, when the Lord says, hey, I forgive you for what you did last week, or when we ask for forgiveness with somebody, we need to leave that place knowing that we have forgiveness. That's just one example, whatever it is. Jesus does it. It's not us. Christ did it all. 
So we come back to the text in verse 27. So when you under, begin to understand this, Paul says, so where is the boasting? He said it's excluded. There is no boasting. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. It is for by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by works. It is a gift of God. It's nothing you can do so that nobody can boast. We can't boast about anything. I would like to tell you that I went to Kentucky and I saved about 50 people over there. But the reality is this. I didn't save anybody. God afforded me the opportunity to go. Even though I didn't want to go, it's inside of me like a burning thing that I can't hold back. That I have to go and share the good news. And because I went and got to go, the Lord saved people. Do you know this? It's never about what you and I do. It's only about what God does. It's never me. That's why Paul said, don't give me any credit. Not I live but Christ lives in me everything I do is to bring him glory the more things I do the more things I say God is good look what he did people all the time say well God don't hear my prayers and I'll say let me tell you a story about a man whose heart's done quit and because people begin to pray God raised him up and he walked out of the hospital let me tell you when people say God don't hear me we can't have children I can tell you two or three times that I prayed with somebody that couldn't were infertile and they said the doctor said we'll try this and we'll try this but people begin to pray and all of a sudden they had twins. Can I tell you that my God is able and we need to quit listening to all the stuff in the world because it's him that does it. It's not us that do it. Take some pressure off. So many times we think it's about me being perfect. It's not about me being perfect. It's about me submitting to him. It's about me being real and admitting that I'm unable to do anything. It's about me not being afraid to come to an altar of God and say, I'm tired and I'm broke down and today I need help, God. I'm sick of acting like I'm doing this perfect and I'm better than everybody else. I'm coming before you, God, in a real way because you are my redeemer and you're the one that gives resurrection to my body and it's not so that I can be good, but it's so that I can magnify your name. Where am I at now? He goes on, he said, how does it happen? Does it happen by keeping the law? Does it happen by the works that you do? He said, no, it has nothing to do with any of that stuff. Now listen to me. The law and works are good, but they can't save us. They don't make you right with God. I fear that there's people that have done right all their life and they've tried so hard to be a good person and they got the legal side and they're tearing it all up. But the reality is they have not been set free and received the justifying grace that he died for us to, to have in redemption. It's not by doing the stuff. It's not by being a good person. I'm sorry, man. It's a dangerous thing in our culture. And I'll talk more about this Later on down the road, but it's a dangerous thing in our culture when we, we hear this all the time. You hear it at funerals. You hear it in situations. Well, man, they, he was a good old guy. She was a good gal. Everybody loved her. She's in a better place now. Is she really? Because it's not about by being good. God said there's none good, no, not one. It's only by his redemption. It's only by his blood. It's not by saying... Well, I know there's a God out there, and he, I've heard that he's a God of love, and he'll just accept us all. He is, but the only way to walk in what he has is through the blood of Jesus. It's the only way. So how does it happen? It happens only by the faith in the one who did it all. The one who was able, and he was willing. You see, Jesus was able to do it. And he was willing to go through it to purchase all of us back. So we find in verse 28, it basically says, A man is justified by faith alone. It's grace, but it's through our faith. It's accepting the grace. It's believing in what Jesus did. Verse 29, he gets on to him a little bit. Basically says, quit fussing, saying that he's only the God of the Jews. Is he not the God of the Gentiles as well? He's the God of everyone he wants everyone to be drawn near to him through his son Jesus. Verse 30, it says, God justifies all who will place their faith in Christ, whether they be uncircumcised or uncircumcised, whether they be white, black, brown, green, whether they be an American or they be a Panamanian or the South American or even an Islamic or whatever they're called over there. He, he wants all of them. By faith to come to him. Do you know this? It doesn't matter if it's a Baptist 
or a Methodist or a Church of Christ or a Catholic or a G or a Pentecostal or a Charismatic or whatever other denomination word that we can come up with. It's not about the church. It's not about the name on the building. It all comes down to this. Do you Have you placed your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ? It's not about anything else. It's not about your show. It's not about how you romance people. It's not about how eloquent you sing or how perfect your rhetoric is. It's all about the blood of Jesus and will I place my faith in it. It's through faith alone. It says in verse 30, but understand this in verse 31. Does that mean that we do away with the law? Does that mean that we nullify it? We don't nullify it. We don't ignore it. We don't put it away, but yet we establish it. We establish it by the way we live. I'm not talking about legalistic, but I'm telling you that when we really understand the redemption of God, it changes our life. And I'm no longer a selfish person who's making it all about me, but now I'm submitting to and I'm making it all about God. And His Word, though I'm not saved by it, it is a guideline for my life. Even though I can't live up to it or keep it all the time, it gives me a guidance of how to live for God, how to worship Him, how to reach out to others, how to raise my children, how to love my wife. It's a guide for me and what I'm called to do. We establish it by the way we live as children of God. The law. So that's it. We're done. Here's the thing, and I'm done. Most of us have experienced God's justifying grace in some way. We've sensed his love. We've heard the messages. We've felt the Jesus bumps that... We're justified that God loves us, that we're okay. I believe that, that many of us have seen his mercy in moments where we messed up and he could have struck us down if he was like the Old Testament God currently. And, and, and we see his mercy that he didn't get found out what I did and I didn't pay the, 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 the price right at that moment. We, we've seen his mercy as he passed over us, his judgment passed over us. And maybe maybe... A lot of us hopefully here have even experienced some reconciliation with God when we understand that it's not about just making it to heaven, but he's actually calling us into the living room with him and he's reconciling us once again as children of God and maybe hopefully through this 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 relationship series that we did and, and many of you have dug into uh, committing to other people and investing into relationships and you're practicing learning how to practice some forgiveness that we found some reconciliation in relationships with people. Healing relationships. But here's a question that I close us with. Are we walking as one that's fully redeemed? Not only forgiven. Not only purchased. But then set free to live. Not afraid to live. Not because I got cleansed this morning at church and now I'm afraid to do any little thing wrong and the moment I do something wrong I'm, I'm shackled again and I feel guilty but free to live a new life and free to love people and free to walk in his authority and not being fearful of when he places somebody in me whether it be in the school or at work or somebody and just say hey lay a hand on them even without them knowing that I'm laying hands on them so that I can pray for them and, and, and just walking in what God's calling us freedom to be who he's called us to be. Not shackled by any of this stuff of the past. The devil is a liar and all that stuff. And it's remembering that because of the blood, when we accept it and we receive what Jesus did, that we truly can become a new creation. And there's freedom in that. There's freedom. I mean, I want people to like me. I want people to think I do a good job. But the reality is they all don't. So do I quit doing it? Do I quit sharing? Do I do what I want to do and just hide at home? When everybody's not happy in church and I'd like to just stay at home, what shall I do? But because of the redemption of Jesus and because my heart is no longer for myself and just to keep me happy, but my heart is to see lives change. My heart is to see people that are shackled and they're burdened and they're hurting and anxiety's eating their lunch and they don't know how they're going to make it to share a moment of hope and let them know that my God is Redeemer and because my Redeemer lives, that He can bring resurrection to my old crusty dead bones and there's still hope as long as I'm breathing because He is alive and He has made me alive. Because I believe this, God wants to do something big with us as a group. 
And it happens as us as individuals walk in redemption, walk in fullness, break the shackles off our habits and our attitudes and all that junk that holds us back and the past and the regrets and always thinking I've done something wrong. I don't deserve anything. And remember that it's never about what you have or have not done, but it's only about the blood of Jesus Christ. And because he did what he did, we're free to live, set free. I got to quit. I had no idea I was going to ramble this long. Good to be home. Redemption. It's not about coming to church. It's not about being good. It's not about what we wear. It's not about anything we do. We can do good stuff all day long. But that's not it. It's because of his blood. It's because of what he did. That we might be redeemed. So the last night, the Lord Jesus was gathered with his disciples. They didn't have a clue, but he was demonstrating for them. He saw their condition. He saw they were, where they were at in life. He saw where they were at in the world. And he said, guys, this is my body. And I'm going to allow it to be broken for you. And after supper was ended, he took the cup. And he gave thanks. And they thought it was just another cup of wine to wash down the unleavened bread. But he said, this is my blood. It's the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which is shed for you. For the forgiveness of sins. For your redemption. That you would be cleansed. That you would be whole. That you would be new. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this day, for loving us. God, we talk about how much you love us, but... Really, all we have to do is look at the cross to the demonstration that you gave the world to express your love and you sent your son to take on the sins of the world that we would be cleansed, that we might become the righteousness of God, not because of anything we do, but only because of you. And so, Father, I just, tonight as we come and partake, God, I just, I just pray freedom. As we come walking, Father, we would see it as walking into the house of God. And we come through the front door and, and there we sup with you. Because your blood washes over us. That we would be cleansed. And so, Father, I speak freedom in this place. No partial redemption. Nobody would be okay with just being justified and still being tormented by this stuff in this world. But we would be set free from it. So, Father, I just pray that you would be upon these elements, Lord. As we come and partake, it would be as if we are truly partaking of what you've done for us.